We're going to talk a little rehab, which is always a great way to proceed. I'm going to talk about slaps. And obviously, I'm going to try to complement what Dr. Ahmad said earlier about slaps and so forth. Great to be in New York. No traffic here. It's great to get around. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Romeo and Dr. Ahmad on a great conference, as always. These are my faculty disclosures. I have no Russian ties whatsoever, just so you know. And obviously, from a rehab standpoint, a lot of factors come into play as far as the type of lesion, who we're dealing with, professional athlete, a scholastic athlete, but also the patient's expectations. Also a big factor for me is obviously rotator cuff, what's going on with the scapula and shoulder pain in general. Um, I, th I thought it was several interesting comments. Uh, one was doctor, by Dr. Noonan who said good tears versus bad tears. I couldn't agree more, you know, some of these tears we really don't worry about. So what are some key points is uh, obviously the rehab has to match the surgery, has to match, match the patient, and is the slap really the pain generator, if you will, or is it something else? Um, one of the other aspects is, you know, in the rehab, rehab process, we really, really need to incorporate the entire body, but particularly the hip and core and so forth. So I'm going to show a couple of videos of exercises because I realize a lot of you in the audience are rehab people, and it kind of gives me a mindset of where I've kind of evolved through the years. You know, in the intermediate phase, you're probably on the table or stability ball doing some exercises. But for me, in that more intermediate to advanced phase, if a person's laying on a table and doing an exercise, and they're a thrower, or an athlete, overhead athlete, something has gone haywire. Most of the time, we put you in a plank, we put you in an unstable position, so you have to incorporate the entire body. Here the person is um, in side plank position. I've got my hand on his shoulder. I'm trying to roll him forward, so he's got to activate his scapula as well. And we do a kind of a, um, a progression as far as the rehab. So you might have started side lying on the table, then we went to a plank, manual resistance, rhythmic staves at end range, and then incorporate some eccentrics as well. So here I've got a piece of TheraBand. He's doing some concentric eccentric. Uh, this is one of our strength and conditioning coaches, so he gives me a hard time about my lack of working out on an ongoing basis. So this is my way of getting even with him. And as far as the, uh, the lever level of activity that he has is the vein in his forehead is really the barometer as far as exertion. So now I added in a, a two pound plyo ball. He really should have a towel roll underneath his arm. Um, that increases the EMG activity. A lot of wall stabilization. Here we have him, an um, uh, individual seated on a stability ball. A lot of times we'll have them elevate one leg, extend their knee, so they bring the core into the equation. You can see his arms moving around a little bit, but I'm pushing him pretty hard. Uh, here I put on a piece of uh, uh, TheraBand CLX, so it's just looped on his wrist. Another individual is trying to pull him forward, so he's got to activate his posterior musculature. What we're trying to do is take one exercise and keep layering it, layering it, making it more and more difficult. There's a lot going on with this particular exercise to explain. This is just simply a wall dribble, if you will, or baseball throw. But I'm looking at his ability to stabilize at end range, but I'm also looking at the ability for him to maintain that 90 degrees of abduction. If he wavers, both anterior and posterior or superior inferior, that's a lack of dynamic stabilization. I'm also looking at the scapula as well. So it seems like a simple exercise, but really that's one of my precursors of whether or not you can start a throwing program. We try to incorporate hips and legs, as I mentioned before. This is a quarterback uh, who's got a little bit of shoulder wear. He's a high school kid at the time of filming. Now he's in college. And all he's doing is a lateral slide, activating his hips, posterior chain as he does his external rotation. So the message is, I don't want a person just to lay on the table and do external rotation. I don't want a person just standing, uh, doing tubing. They may start there, but if they're going to be a high-level performing individual, we've got to take it to a higher level. This person's on a stability ball. That metal little V is called the halo. It's a way of stabilizing the stability ball so it doesn't roll out of the way. Incorporating hips, uh, step downs. Uh, that's one of the things we do on clinical exam. I mean, one of the first things in a standing position is see if you could do a single leg squat, especially in kids. Most kids have weak hips, right? Lateral hip, posterior chain. So this is actually an elbow patient. A lot of lateral slides, another elbow patient, UCL. He's doing a lateral slide. I throw a basketball to him just because it's a lot easier for me to throw that than wear a glove in the clinic. Um, volleyball player with a slap type of problem, non-op. Here we've got the TheraBand CLX again, legs. So as she brings her arms up overhead and AB ducks, uh, it's putting stress on her hips and she has to fire. Obviously we're looking at landing, but I'm also looking at her uh, shoulders as well. Posterior chain, posterior wall type exercises, person standing up against the wall, nice stretch on pec minor. 
We've got a piece of TheraBand. Now he's activating his triceps, but it gets progressively more difficult. This is a postural exercise for me. It's a way of stretching anterior, activating posterior musculature without just going in the corner and doing a pec minor stretch. Now I've got that piece of one band uh, of CLX, and I'm actually pulling them away from the wall. Look at the facial expression on this guy. This is another one of our strength and conditioning coaches uh, now in the Orioles organization. And he's in shape, and he can do a lot of these exercises, but when we add in this element of trying to pull him away from the wall, his posterior cuff has to fire. Endurance. We've shown in kids that the number one reason kid gets, kids get hurt is because they pitch when they're fatigued. So we're always emphasizing endurance. These are uh, lateral ball drops in the T position or horizontal ab abduction. That's a four-pound dumbbell in his opposite hand. A lot of times we'll start with no weight. So everything is activated posterior chain, posterior hip, spine, hamstrings, scapula, posterior cuff. Those are all random, so I'll tell them to drop, drop the ball and maybe hold at particular times. BFR, we'll talk about this this afternoon. I know we have a couple talks on this. Uh, blood flow restriction. This is something I think you need to uh, progress slowly, like he's doing. He's going a little too slow. I'm not sure what's up with that video, but uh, we, we don't go quite that slow. But BFR, um, blood flow restriction, is an interesting concept that we use selectively in throwers, and maybe this afternoon we could talk more about that. So what about these slaps? Well, we know it's mechanical in nature. Uh, it was mentioned before, a lot of times they're asymptomatic individuals. We did a study years ago with Ken Crenshaw and Jamie Reed with the Rays, where we MRI'd asymptomatic pitchers uh, with the Rays organizations, and 90% of them had something going on with their labrum documented by a radiologist. Dr. Miniachi, when he was with the Blue Jays, showed about 79%. So we know this occurs. There was a recent study out of San Diego looking at Little League individuals, baseball players, 52% had abnormality on their labrum. So it's somewhat of a common finding, and obviously not all of these are going to the OR. So how do people hurt their shoulder? Well, this seems like a healthy event, right? <laughs> it's good for business. Another healthy event here is walking your dog. Seems relatively benign, but there is a ratio between the size of the dog and the person walking them, <laughs> and a traction injury as well. So what about slaps and outcomes and so forth? Well, we mentioned before that a lot of times there's concomitant cuff pathology, and we've written on this. This is a couple papers. The uh, upper paper is from the Curlin Job Clinic. The basic showed about 57% return back to pre-injury level with a slap repair. But there were poor outcomes in certain individuals. Dr. Ahmad mentioned this study already, so I won't belabor that. Dr. Lintner study that showed pretty much an equal distribution between repairs and non-op and pitchers, but the position players did much better with a repair than non-op. This is a paper from our Birmingham Center where we looked at 216 slap repairs in baseball players, and about 62% returned back to play, 59% of the pitchers, but the take-home message is, again, position players do better. This is a paper from our center in Pensacola, Dr. Andrews, and if you look at there was a um, higher distribution of scholastic athletes versus professional, and they had a higher rate of going back. So in high-level individuals, sometimes it's hard to get them back, as you heard. This is a study we did with our biomechanics lab in, in Birmingham, where Dr. Fleissig basically looked at slap repairs and had them come back and look at their throwing mechanics. Now, he didn't have pre-op biomechanical analysis, but post-op, and what we found was basically they had a limitation in external rotation and horizontal abduction. Even though on the table they looked good, their range of motion when throwing was different. And I think that's an important component is many times we see them on the table, and what I mean by that on physical exam, and their motion looks good, but they tell you they feel tight. I think there is a change in their end range elasticity. And I think some of the things that happen with these throwers is an adaptation uh, to the superior posterior labrum, your peel back lesion. This is a paper by Stan Conti that basically looked at uh, professional baseball players and shoulder and elbow surgeries. And you see this, ra uh, not necessarily a rapid, but it, a gradual incline in the number of elbow surgeries compared to a decline in, uh, in shoulder. So where is the pain coming from and what do we do? Well, we know that slap repairs and high-level pitchers are difficult to get back, so maybe a non-op program is, is important. So let's talk uh, in the last 10 minutes here about some rehab concepts, if you will. So let's say for a uh, relatively simple debridement, let's call it that, debridement of a type one or debridement of a type three type slap. 
Um, obviously, they're going to have some post-operative discomfort. We use laser therapy. I like iontophoresis as well. Many times, I'm really treating the cuff. I'm treating the cuff, I'm treating the biceps, and I'm treating for dynamic stabilization. Uh, we use a sling for comfort. Uh, it's usually just a few days. It's immediate motion the next day. And usually within about 10 days to 14 days, they have full range of motion back. So it's pretty quick type of rehab. Really, for me, the focus is on dynamic stabilization, core, and correcting whatever problem they had that led to uh, the problem with their labrum. So simple dynamic stabilization exercise. So this is a thrower. And I just put him into a neutral position, plane of the scapula, and I ask him to hold a static position. You can see he wavers a little bit. I don't really like that, but I'm using that as an example. I want them to be as rigid as possible. So I'm looking at coactivation, the ability to center your humeral head, keep it in the center of the glenoid, and maintain that position no matter where I put you in the amount of external rotation. This seems low level. But you'd be surprised when you do this with a kid. Maybe it's a, a tension deficit that some little leaguers have, but it's their inability to hold a static position. And for me, I cannot progress you until you have dynamic stabilization, period. I don't care who you are in my mind. I also look at ratios. Dr. Romeo mentioned this before when they were talking about the clinical exam. So I use handheld dynamometers, and I get very objective in my IR-ER ratio, my ER-deltoid ratio, and my scapular ratios as well. And we've published that. I'm going to try to go back. Can you go back for me? I Reverse is not working. And if you could just click it. Thank you, sir. So here's an individual, again, towel roll, which is good. That increases your EMG activity by about 20%. We did a study on that several years ago. I had my hand on his shoulder. I was trying to roll him forward. That way, he's got to retract and stabilize. So he does his external rotation with tubing, and I add some manual resistance. Sideline ER is the highest level of EMG activity for your posterior cuff. So if you're going to pick one exercise to strengthen the posterior cuff, it's sideline ER, with a towel roll, by the way. So here I've got him sideline. Again, my hand is on his shoulder. I'm trying to roll him forward. I really don't like his C-spine position, so don't put that in the eval. <laughs> don't write me up on that, please. Uh, I was daydreaming. I was watching Sports Center. I had to see if my, my teams came in or something. I don't know. So now we're doing an end range stabilization exercise. So I'm always working on stabilization. Uh, we talked about the side plank already. Endurance exercises. What are some great uh, uh, endurance exercises? We like ball drops at the right time frame. So sideline ball drops, prone on the table, then we'll progress to a, uh, a stability ball like this. As I mentioned before, we're doing random holds, if you will. When do they start throwing? And you see there's a big window there, 6 to 12 weeks. It really depends on concomitant problems, cuff, biceps, and so forth. We do have a criteria to return the throw. Uh, A.J. Yanchuk is going to talk about that this afternoon, so I'm not going to mention it now. But we do have a specific criteria we started a couple years ago. What about slap repairs? Well, it's a little different story for me if somebody has a slap repair. No excessive motion for a good 10 to 12 weeks, but we are moving you. It depends on the location, concomitant problems, number of anchors used, and location of the lesion. We don't do biceps for a good eight weeks just because of irritation and so forth, and no heavy lifting no matter who you are for 12 to 14 weeks. No closed chain exercises, push-ups, watch our planks for a good eight to 12 weeks as well. Caution with the sleeper stretch, which I'm not a big fan of anyway, so we do cross-body stretching, which I think increases your internal rotation better. We use a sling for comfort for about four to six weeks. You sleep in it for four weeks, but we start moving you right away. Uh, gradually, in the plane of the scapula, usually about 30 degrees, and somewhere around six weeks, five weeks, we'll bring you up to the 90-90 position. 90 degrees of abduction, 90 degrees of elbow flexion. We expect full normal range of motion about eight weeks, and at 12 weeks, we expect thrower's motion. I think the number one reason slaps don't make it back is because of tightness. Um, I hesitate in saying this, but if a high-level thrower pulls it off a little bit, between you and me, I don't really care. Um, I think that's going to be okay. I just don't want them to pull off too much. Um, I tell them to be very cautious. I never tell that to a patient, by the way, so don't tell my patients I said that. Um, we use a sling at night just because of the position they sleep in and so forth. Uh, range of motion we talked about. What about strengthening? As I mentioned before, it's a submax program initially. It's isometrics in the first week. We start a thrower's 10 type of program, usually about three or four weeks. Advanced thrower, about 10. Interval throwing, four months roughly, but it depends on cuff, 
and other factors, and usually can start hitting about two weeks faster. A lot of uh, muscle stim, a lot of scapula, probably 80% of the program is scapula and core. A lot of uh, prone rows in the ER, a lot of scapula neuromuscular exercise as well. So this is an example of a scapula neuromuscular exercise. Can't be done early, has to be done fairly late in the rehab. Sideline, hand on the table, slowly protracts, retracts. And the idea is hold the humerus stationary and your motion is coming from the scapula. Complete reverse of what you do in real life. In real life, your arm moves, your scapula follows. Now I'm saying don't move your humerus. And we'll start this in a seated position first. Throwers 10, we have that published in numerous areas. Um, you can go to our ASMI website as well. It's basically about 16 exercises. Our advanced throwers program is more of the sustained holds, if you will. We publish this as well. You actually have a little bit of a jump up in your EMG. So I'll show you a couple exercises and I'll wrap this up. The Advanced Throwers 10 was really developed a bunch of years ago, probably about 12 years ago, when throwers came back and said, I'm using lightweight, and I've been doing that for several years. And the idea was, well, how can we do lightweight still so you don't get bulky or you don't get too tight, but you still get the effects of exercise? So here he has a four-pound dumbbell. He did his full can. He would have done 10 reps in the clinic. On the 10th rep, he holds one side, and he moves the opposite. So it's endurance, it's posture, and we get a bump up on our EMG on the side he's moving. It increases by about 5 to 7%, which again, doesn't seem like much, but if we keep stacking it up a little bit, little bit more with each exercise, I think it has some benefit as well. So my favorite ones are the prone. I don't think the uh, patients really enjoy it very much, but these are very, very tough endurance type exercises. Again, elite individuals do pretty well with this, Kids do horribly. I mean, they are miserable doing these exercises. And what I mean by that is you're challenging them to a level that they haven't been challenged before. They're complaining about that their, their hips hurt and I can't do it and you know, all these little whining little comments, and, uh, which I actually enjoy for some morbid type of reason. I don't know why. Um, but the point of the story is we're trying to take you to a level that you're not going to have an injury down the road. And that's what I explained to him. You may not like it at the time, but this is going to make you a better athlete. This is going to decrease your probability of injury down the road. So this is tough. With kids, the whole time what I'm telling them is keep your knees locked, your hips locked out. It's never about the shoulder. Trust me on that. I've never had a problem with somebody saying it's too much on my shoulder. These are high rows. Love high rows. We do it on cable columns. We do it with... Uh, Bands, as you see here, whatever you have at your disposal. It's amazing to me, again, for those of you who see youth baseball players, how weak they are in their periscapular muscles, as Dr. Romeo and Dr. Noonan had mentioned in the exam part, and Dr. Schicken dance. Uh, we do these shoulder extensions. It's almost like a little bit of a rest in the series, but I wanted to get to the lower trap exercise that we like the best. And this is a takeoff of Dr. Kibler's work, the robbery, and a lot of you use that robbery type of movement. So we did a study on that comparing the robbery to this movement, which is really a modified robbery. The EMG is higher for lower trap and lower for upper trap. Because by going in the robbery movement, you're actually elevating your shoulders more. So you get a bump up in the upper trap. So just Food for thought. A lot of times I add in manual resistance with the tubing, and the reason I do that, I get a sense for what the patient feels. I get a sense for how they're progressing. So it's almost a clinical exam with every rep, so to speak. But the other thing it does is tubing is not affected through a full arc of motion, obviously. So here he's doing a hold on one side, and we're doing external rotation on the other. That's a tough exercise. Uh, we do bilateral, uh, otherwise you end up like that. And we do a lot of stabilizations and plyometrics as well, two hand progressing to one hand. A lot of ball drops, as I mentioned before, will start you on the table, but the idea is to eventually get onto an unstable surface like you see here. So to wrap this up, when do we start a throwing program with an isolated slap repair, which I'm not sure exists? Uh, somewhere around four to five months. When would they return to sports? Our follow-up studies say about nine months to 12 months. Slaps are, can be tough to treat. We try to treat them non-operatively in most cases, but there's a whole variety of different types of slaps and common problems. Thank you very much for your kind attention.